Thank you all very much. What a fantastic audience we have this evening. <laughs> Maybe, as most of you are on that side, I'll stand this side so you can see the screen a little better. That's fine, that's fine. No, that's fine. So this is about misconceptions, and specifically misconceptions about how the universe works, misconceptions in astronomy. I've given a number of astronomy talks, and over the years I've found a lot of people have had various questions for me afterwards, and a lot of those questions arise from misconceptions. So let's go through this. I've got four particular topics I want to cover. How the universe works in terms of an expanding universe, the idea of matter and black holes and dark matter, a little bit on rocket science and a little bit on quantum mechanics. And I'm going to borrow from various talks that I've given in the past. Let me just get that out of the way. So I'm using slides that I've used in other talks to illustrate this particular talk. And these four little concepts, these topics, um, I can break at each one if you've got any questions, or I can just plow on through and see if there's any questions at the end, depending on how you want to do this. But one thing we have to remember is that there is no reason whatsoever why the universe has to make sense to us. The universe doesn't owe us anything. The fact that we can comprehend the universe is absolutely amazing. The fact that monkeys can fall out of trees and half a million years later can actually make sense of what's around us is pretty amazing. And as Einstein said, one of the most incomprehensible things about the world, or the universe, if you prefer, is that it is comprehensible. We can make sense of the stuff around us. So let's make a start on an expanding universe. The universe was born in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, and ever since then it's been expanding. And after the Big Bang, lots of stars, lots of galaxies came into existence. But a question you often get is, well, where was the Big Bang? Where do I have to point my telescope to see where the Big Bang occurred? And that basic misconception is the idea that you can step outside of the universe and watch it go bang. That's not the way it works. We're all part of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the start of everything. So you can't look in one particular direction and say that is where it all began. And other people have said, well, if the James Webb Space Telescope, recently launched, recently operational, can look back in time, will it be able to look back in time and see the Big Bang? Well, no, because it can't look back that far. The other, question, the other question, which I thought was quite a good one, if the James Webb Space Telescope can look back in time, what if they pointed it at the Earth? Would they see dinosaurs? No, no, no. It, it doesn't actually work that way. So, the James Webb Space Telescope can look back perhaps 13, maybe 13 and a half billion years that's a long way back to the start of the universe, but not quite to time t equals zero. But when it comes to looking back, I thought to myself, as a lockdown project, I wonder how far back in time you can look. What is the farthest object that you can possibly photograph? Not with a telescope, not with the James Webb, not with the Hubble, not with a big telescope in your back garden, but with the camera that I normally use for taking pictures of zebras if I'm doing some wildlife photography or something like that. So my camera with a telephoto lens, I ask myself, what's the most distant object I can photograph with that setup in my back garden? The camera is there with a telephoto lens and it's sitting on this white box, which is basically just a motor in a box. It's called a star tracker because it's designed to turn the camera once a day. So as the stars appear to rotate because of the Earth's rotation, then this, this uh, motor in a box will simply move the camera to track the stars effectively. And hence the stars won't trail if I take a long exposure. So in July of 2020, with nothing better to do in lockdown, I thought I'd give this a crack. So I took a picture of a chunk of sky where I expected to find a very distant galaxy, because I looked it up in somebody's paper who said there is a very distant galaxy in this constellation at that location. And it happened to be high in the sky. So I thought that's good. This particular galaxy has got a supermassive black hole at the center, and it's producing an awful lot of energy, and these particular objects are called quasars. You don't have to worry about the name, it's just a type of galaxy. So I figured that if I take a chunk of sky almost directly overhead in the middle of summer, I hope to have caught this quasar. It's not that dot in the middle, that's just a star. I hope the quasar is in the middle of that particular square there, because I looked up its coordinates of where I would expect to find it. 
I took a picture and then I blew up that central region where you see the two red lines, that tiny, tiny little dot in the middle, that is what I was trying to photograph. That quasar is, you can see, most of the light from that quasar has been focused into just about one pixel. I got a 20 megapixel camera, but only about one pixel actually caught that quasar. So it's not a very impressive picture. It's a very unimpressive photograph in terms of an image of a very distant galaxy, but the distance to that galaxy is what is so incredible. Now, when it comes to working out distance, that's a problem. And it's a problem because the universe is expanding. This is where most misconceptions come from. If you ask how far is it from Liverpool to Coventry, I don't know what the answer is, but it's a fixed distance. Whatever it was yesterday, that's the same as today. It's the same as tomorrow. If you travel from Coventry to Liverpool, if you're lucky enough to be able to do that, it doesn't matter how slow or how fast you travel, it's still the same distance from Coventry to Liverpool. The universe doesn't work that way. The universe is in constant, uh, constant expansion. So objects are moving away from Earth. So as the light travels to Earth, we have to remember that space is continuing to expand. As it might take millions or possibly billions of years for the light from the galaxy to reach us, during that time, the universe is continuing to expand. So asking how far did the light travel, well, that's actually quite a tricky question. You could ask how far was the galaxy when the light left. You could ask how far away was the galaxy when the light arrived. Or you could ask how far has the light been traveling. But it's not an easy question, because unlike distances on Earth, the distances keep changing. So light traveling through space, where space is expanding, is a bit like swimming through water, where the water is if you like, a tide against you. And another analogy is think about an ant walking along a rubber band and somebody is then stretching the rubber band. How far does the ant walk? Well, it's a bit tricky to work out because it depends on how fast the ant is walking and how fast you're stretching the rubber band. And it's really, the best mind is when you're thinking about distant objects, it isn't actually possible to measure the distance to a remote object it isn't actually possible to measure how long the light has been traveling. The only thing you can do is look at the spectrum of light from a distant object, like a galaxy, and because the light gets stretched out as the universe is stretching, as the universe is expanding, the light itself gets stretched out. You can see that in the spectrum. When you take the light from a distant galaxy and separate it into its colors, you can see that light gets shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, and the more distant the object, the more the light gets shifted. So the one thing you can measure for a distant object is the so-called redshift by looking at its spectrum. And you have to calculate from a redshift if it's been stretched by this much, if the light has been stretched by this much, can I calculate how far it is to the object and how long the light has been traveling. And to do that, you have to have some idea of how the universe is expanding. But if we do understand how the universe is expanding, then for a distant object, if its spectrum is measured, not by me, but by somebody else, then it is possible to calculate distances. And here, for a given redshift, we don't have to worry about what the numbers mean. The larger the number, the more the light has been stretched, and the more distant the object. And the three colors here tell you how far away, for a given redshift, how far away was the object when the light left the object? How far has the light traveled to reach us? and how far is the object away now? And for this particular galaxy that I photographed with my camera, the redshift happens to have that particular value. So we can read off the distances, and to make it a little bit easier, let me just erase the curves and just keep the numbers. So for this particular object, which I photographed from my back garden, it was about five billion light years away when the light left. It's now about 25 billion light years away, and it's taken 12.4 billion years for the light to reach us. Let's just recap that. Five billion light years when the light left. The light has been traveling for more than 12 billion years. Given that the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, that's 90% of the age of the universe. Even though the light has been traveling for 90% of the age of the universe, it's still possible to catch that light and make an image in a camera in your back garden. And as that 
light has been traveling for a long, 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 long time. During that time, the universe continued to expand, and that object is now some 25 billion light years away. And misconception number 37 is if you look at the numbers, over a time period of 12 billion years, how far away is it to the object? Well, it started at 5, and then it went to 25. It's increased its distance from us by 20 billion light years, but it did it over a time period of 12 billion years. Its distance has increased by more than 12 billion light years. So that means it must be receding from us faster than the speed of light. Yes, that's rather shocking. <laughs> but it is a fact. A big misconception is that can't happen. No. Objects can't move through space faster than that, but that doesn't stop space expanding at any speed it wants to and taking the galaxies with it. They're just along for the ride, if you think of it that way. In this particular case, the object I photographed, when the light left the object, it had a velocity away from us of 2.2 times the speed of light. Little c there is the speed of light. So it was receding from us at more than twice the speed of light. It then slowed down a little bit. This is time from the Big Bang on the left to where we are now. It slowed down for a while, and rather oddly, it now seems to be accelerating again. It's getting a little bit faster, and it's now receding from us at about 1.7 times the speed of light. At no point did it drop below 1. At no point did the recession velocity of this object drop below the speed of light. And yet it is still possible to photograph it. That's really weird, and it comes back to the universe doesn't behave the way you figure. Your common sense is based on velocities that are more sensible and distances which are tangible, not these ridiculous distances in the universe. If we say, well, okay, this is a plot here of distance from us, and this is, a dis this is time, so Big Bang is at zero, and time goes upwards until we get to us, here and now, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. If light leaves the quasar, we might say, well, the light, the quasar starts off at about 5 billion light years from us, so as time goes by, as time goes vertical, surely the light gets closer and closer and closer to us. Well, no, it can't, because the universe is expanding at a velocity which is faster than the speed of light. Remember the ant on the rubber band, or the swimmer swimming through water where the water is flowing faster than they can swim. So just like a swimmer would get dragged backwards by a receding tide, what happens here is really, really weird. If the quasar is receding from us faster than light, the light gets dragged backwards. And the light, although it starts off 5 billion light years from us, it actually ends up, after a little while, getting further away. That is so counterintuitive. Billions of years after the light left the quasar, the light is further away than when it started. And only after a little while does the light finally make some headway and end up arriving here, now, i.e. 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. Not intuitively obvious, full of conceptual problems and full of misconceptions because it is so far removed from everyday experience. So that is the first set of misconceptions. So I can pause here and either you can throw something at me now or if you need to sit and think about it and imbibe a little bit more, I can move on to the next really weird thing, and we can come back to this in a few minutes. If there's anything desperate people want to ask? Yes? Yep. Yep. That's right, yes, yes. If you want to think of it, that, yeah, there is, no, there is no point that you can identify that is it. One thing you can say is, it's everywhere. Yeah. And that's the basic point. There is not one special point. You can't point at one part of the sky and say it happened there, not there. Yeah. So one way of thinking of it is it happened everywhere and it's still happening and it's, quote, all around us. What you can't do is step out of the universe and say, there it is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah? Okay. That's, that's as far back as you can see. If you want to keep looking back in time, beyond 13.5,
James Webb will probably get to 13.5, maybe 13.6 billion years. It will never get to the Big Bang for precisely that reason. You can only get back to the cosmic microwave background, which is shortly after the Big Bang, and no telescope that works with electromagnetic radiation can go back any further than that. You have to find some other way of doing astronomy if you want to go beyond that particular point. Yes? Yes. Um, when I was a lad, I thought it was a possibility, they said it was a possibility, that the universe is expanding and maybe one day it'll stop and then contract again because gravity always pulls. But now it looks like in the last 20 years there's enough evidence that implies that it's expanding and will continue to expand forever. So up until 20 years ago, the, the jury was out. Now it looks like the expansion will always continue. No, the, uh, yeah. that's right, the, the, the rate seems to be changing and this bit is understandable, it's slowing down. So for the first few billion years, the universe expansion was slowing down, which is what you'd expect from gravity. But then, after a few billion years, it seems to be, ex so that little uptick at the end is the acceleration of the universe, which was the big surprise that, that hit us 20 years ago. Okay, we can return to this later if you like, if we move on with concept number two. Concept number two, black holes suck. Well, no, they don't. Uh, and dark matter is not dark, another um, sort of misnomer, if you like. The idea of a black hole as being some sort of plug hole down which matter goes. Well, that's not actually a bad analogy. It's not great, but it's not bad. It's a two-dimensional picture of what's going on around a black hole. We now have a better idea simply because we can image Technically, not the black hole itself, we can image matter that is effectively going down the plug hole. So this is an image taken, uh, the data was taken in 2017, and it's showing matter that is effectively getting hot, swirling around the black hole, waiting its turn to get sucked into the black hole, which you can't see somewhere towards the middle. There's a sort of shadow in the middle there uh, where the black hole will reside. And more recently, we've had a release of data from the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy rather than that one which was at the center of a more distant galaxy. So that's the matter that's circling our own supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. But this idea that black holes suck and as soon as something becomes a black hole, that's it, that's the end of everything in the neighborhood because everything will just get sucked straight down. Now indeed, if a star gets too close to a black hole at the center of this blue disk here, it's possible the material gets sucked off and ends up getting down this plug hole. But the assumption that just because you have a black hole that means gravity is so, 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 so much stronger than anything else is, a, is again a misconception. If you imagine the Earth going around the Sun being held in orbit by the gravity of the Sun, if the Sun were to collapse into a black hole, the Earth would still be in an orbit. It wouldn't go straight into the Sun. It would still be the same mass at the same distance and with the same mass at the same distance, you'll have the same gravitational force, and therefore the Earth will behave the same way. We'll complain that we don't have any sunlight anymore if it turns into a black hole, but it doesn't mean the gravity suddenly goes up a thousandfold because it's the same mass simply compressed into a smaller volume. That's all a black hole is. And if you stay at the same distance as you were the distance from the sun, then the pull is exactly the same. So black holes are mysterious, but not um, as deadly as some people think in the sense it's not going to consume the rest of the galaxy if you make a black hole. But then we have the problem, well, okay, that's black holes and they're obviously dark. Is that the same stuff as dark matter? Is dark matter just black holes? If we separate the universe into stuff we know about and stuff we don't, we find the stuff we know about is only 16% of what's actually out there. That 16% you might think is, well, all the stars and all the galaxies. Well, actually, no. Stars actually only account for a very small amount of the amount of matter that we know exists. Most of the matter that we can account for is hydrogen and helium. In other words, there's far more boring gas out there than there are stars and galaxies, but that's just the way it is. But the elephant in the room is, okay, if the 16% is what we understand, 
what's this other stuff? What is the 84% that we don't seem to understand? What the hell is that actually made of? It's not that. It's not dark matter in the sense of, well, there's a horse head and it's obviously dark, so that is dark matter. No, no. Dark matter is something more enigmatic. Dark matter cannot absorb light and cannot emit light. This clearly can absorb light because that horse head is absorbing light from the, from the, thank, from the region in the background there. So this is just ordinary matter, probably a whole load of dust, that is absorbing light from behind. But dark matter is invisible in the sense that it doesn't absorb, doesn't emit, and hence we cannot see it, unlike this stuff. So if we can't see it, how do we know it's there? Well, there's lots of strands of evidence. One is to look at how galaxies rotate, and in this little cartoon, the, the stars are moving quite quickly in the core and rather slowly towards the edge, and that is what we would expect for a galaxy full of matter that we understand. But that's not what we observe. What we actually observe when we look at galaxies is they seem to be moving, the stars seem to be moving quite quickly in the center and also quite quickly at the edge. If you just pick a dot or two, it's just a video that's continually starting and starting again. If you look at some of these outer stars, they're moving a lot faster here than they are on the left-hand side. So something is allowing these outer stars to move much faster than we can account for. If we work out the mass of the galaxy by effectively counting all the stars and working out how massive the galaxy is, we cannot account for how fast these stars are moving. So without dark matter, we expect the left-hand picture, but that's not what we observe. We observe the right-hand picture, and so we say there must be something else there. Apart from all the matter we can account for, there must be something else going on in apparently every galaxy that we look at, and we don't know what it is, so we just give it the rather misleading name, dark matter. Strictly speaking, it should be called something like transparent matter or invisible matter, but no, the name has stuck. So it's not dark, but it does seem to exist. Golf balls. Yeah, <laughs> The universe used to be a lot smaller. We know it's expanding, so we know it used to be smaller. The mind-boggling conclusion is, if we know how big the universe is now, and we run the clock backwards, the current diameter of the observable universe, everything we can see, trillions of galaxies, each of which have got hundreds of billions of stars, that entire sphere is something like 100 billion light years in diameter. We know it used to be smaller. If you go back far enough, used to be the size of a golf ball. That takes a little bit of imagination. And people question whether that's right or not. And the answer is we don't actually know, but it is hypothesized that if it's big now and it's getting bigger, then it used to be very small. And maybe, a long time ago, it used to be about the size of a golf ball. I like this analogy because golf balls have got dimples in them. And the early universe had dimples as well. Not dimples in the sense of a golf ball, but small variations Okay, the universe seems to be bouncing away. Small variations in density in the very early universe eventually became all of the galaxies and ultimately all of the stars that we see today. In other words, over billions of years, as that golf ball expanded into the universe we see today, gravity took hold and small variations in density ultimately became the galaxies that we see today. So if we take a small region of space and let gravity do its stuff, over billions of years, this computer simulation says we would expect the universe to end up looking like this on a large scale. There are filaments, there are voids, and where these filaments cross each other, matter seems to be streaming down into these very highly concentrated areas. These little white blobs are the blobs that will ultimately become the galaxies uh, and the superclusters of galaxies that we see today. When we look out into the universe, the galaxies are not uniformly distributed. They are clumped together. And we see these filaments and we see these voids when we look at the distribution of galaxies. So this simulation seems to explain how the universe came to look the way it does. But it only works if we put dark matter into the mix. If we try this simulation without any dark matter, we can't get the universe to look right. We can't get the universe to look the way it does now after 13.8 billion years of simulation. We can only get the simulations to work if dark matter is in the mix. So galaxies tell us dark matter exists. 
the large-scale structure of the universe tells us that dark matter exists. And as I said a moment ago, the amount of matter that we think we understand is only a small amount of the total amount of matter. And what is this mysterious substance that we mentioned just a moment ago that seems to be making the expansion of the universe accelerate? Well, we don't know what that is either. But when it comes to things we do understand, it's only 4% of the total. In other words, we label the things we don't understand dark to say we don't understand them. Dark matter and dark energy are just labels of we don't understand what this is and we don't understand what that is. But it makes up 96% of the universe. 4% we understand, the other 96% is, well, it's out there, but we really don't know what it is. Whether it's scary or not, I don't know, but it's embarrassing to say that we really don't understand what it is. Let's take another very short pause. Any questions on that? Um, only that, there's two ways to answer that. One answer is no. And we know, uh, the, the no answer is we don't know why, but it must have had dimples, otherwise we can't explain galaxies. The other answer is, well, that's what quantum fluctuations do. If you have a quantum fluctuation, and this is a fluctuation of nothing, which is really difficult to get the head round, if you start with nothing, it is possible to get something from nothing. That's perfectly okay within the rules of quantum mechanics to start with nothing and get something. And maybe the universe started that way. And quantum fluctuations tend to be irregular. They fluctuate. That's what they do. And that's why the golf ball has got dimples in it. Anything else for the moment? Yes? Yes? Sixteen percent we understand and eighty-four percent we don't. How do we know those? How do we know those numbers? Yeah, yeah very good. Um, by, by looking at how galaxies rotate, by looking at how galaxies rotate, we can tell that we haven't accounted for all the mass. And by looking at the speed at stars movement and using good old Newtonian mechanics, we don't even need Einstein for this, we can say the amount of mass that must be there is five times larger than the amount of mass that we can account for. So in other words, we can say that we, are, we know about this much, but five times as much is in the other category, as it were. Yep, okay, so we can do it from various measurements, including some I haven't mentioned. Okay, let's see how far we get with the next idea. Rocket science. After all, <coughs> it's not rocket science, is it? So. Overcoming gravity, the James Webb Space Telescope park at a position in space where there's absolutely nothing sitting there. So it's not about this. This is technology. This is engineering. Building a rocket and getting it to leave the ground is basically just nuts and bolts. What you do with it once you've left the ground is rocket science, how you get from one place to another. But Newton understood all of this. Again, we're coming back to 350 years ago. Most people think a rocket's purpose is to get off the ground. Well, technically, no. The purpose of a rocket is to move sideways fast enough to go into orbit. In other words, if you had a cannon on a big mountain, if you could fire the cannonball fast enough, if you go too slow, the cannonball will just drop to Earth. If you go fast enough, it might be possible to get the cannonball to go all around the Earth and go into orbit. That is the purpose of a rocket, to give you sideways motion, which is fast enough to go into orbit. Yes, you need a little bit of height. Trying to go into orbit 100 meters off the ground is prone to problems. You're going to hit buildings and mountains and various other things. But in principle, as long as you don't have other things in the way, you can orbit at any height you like. You can, in principle, orbit just off the ground. But so in practice, a rocket goes vertically and very quickly then starts to go sideways. So the need for horizontal velocity was understood a long, long time ago. And people think rocket science is hard because math always gets in the way of understanding rocket science. But I would argue the basic principles are easy enough to understand. Let's just think about two objects going around the sun. 
let's think of it as a green planet and a red planet, for instance. The green planet is closer to the sun. If it's closer to the sun, it has a stronger gravitational pull. So just like our cannonball on a mountain, if it goes too slow, it will end up going towards the sun. If we go fast enough, we'll end up in an orbit that keeps it in a circle. And let's say, for the sake of argument, that that takes one year. The period is normally referred to the number of years. Let's just think of the green as Earth. It has a, a period of one year. The red planet is further from the sun. If the red planet is further from the sun, its gravitational pull of the sun is weaker. So it doesn't have to go anything like as fast to stay in a circular orbit. So the green planet has to move fast because it's getting pulled to the sun, so it goes faster. The red planet, further from the sun, doesn't have to go as fast, and so you get that particular result. You could argue that that is all there is to orbital mechanics. That is all there is to rocket science. Okay, in practice, it's a little more complicated, and in practice, you have to deal with mass, and in practice, not all orbits are circular. Some of them are elliptical, which makes things horrible. But in principle, that's really all you need to know. That idea that if you're close to the sun, you move fast, and if you're further from the sun, or whatever the thing pulling you is, if the gravitational force is strong, you move fast. If the gravitational pull is not so strong, you move slower. As long as you remember that, then everything else makes perfect sense. So how can you park at somewhere that, where there's actually nothing there? Let's just have a hypothetical, let's think about this. Let's imagine green is the Earth, and red is some orbit, which is a radius slightly larger than the Earth's radius. So Earth goes around the Sun in one year. The red orbit is larger, so it's further from the Sun, so it would have an orbit period of more than a year. For instance, if it was Mars, it would have an orbit period of about one and a half years. But what if, hypothetically, what if that's not a planet, it's just an object orbiting like the Earth, but a bit further away from the Sun, what if the red object was close enough to the green object so that it was not only pulled by the Sun, but it also got pulled a little bit by the green planet as well? It is possible to think about and juggle the maths to think about a red orbit that's at just the right distance, so as well as the yellow arrow pulling you to the sun, there's also a little tug in the same direction pulling you towards the green planet as well. And it is possible to find an orbit where that extra tug of the Earth is just enough to give you a period of one year. Remember, the red planet, the red object, ought to have a period of more than a year, but if it gets pulled a little bit stronger because of the extra pull of the Earth, it's possible to have a period of one year. And if they both have a period of one year, the red object and the green object go round together. In other words, as seen from the Earth, the red object seems to be just stuck there. It's just there all the time. Unlike what we had before, where the red object goes round the Sun in a lot longer period. So the arrows just remind you that the red object is always getting pulled towards the sun and always getting pulled towards the earth, the green object. And that's all there is to Lagrange points in principle. L2 is simply that point there. In other words, if we get rid of the extraneous stuff, earth is getting pulled towards the sun and takes a year to go round. L2 is a point in space which is getting pulled by the sun and pulled by the earth, which means L2 goes round in a year. L2 follows the Earth. In other words, it's a point in space which appears to just track the Earth. That's why you can basically park there and the, teles uh, the object, whether it be the James Webb Space Telescope or something else, doesn't go flying off because L2 is kept in position. Bear in mind my diagram is not to scale. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit and the distance from the Earth to L2 is something like a hundred times less than that. It's about a million miles. It's much further than the distance to the moon. It's about four times further away than the moon's radius, but it's some hundred times closer to the Earth than the sun is, so quite definitely not to scale. But in terms of, okay, there's a place there in principle you can park, what is James Webb actually doing? Well, it helps to have a slightly different picture of what's going on at L2. And this particular way of thinking of it, you can only really generate these things with maths, but in principle, what's happening is, if you think about these contours as representing height, and this particular representation is looking at how 
it is possible to sit at these various Lagrange points. Lagrange point two is called L2, the others we're not going to worry about. But if you think about these contours as representing height and ask yourself, how does a ball want to roll downhill? Let's have a closer look at what's going on, on around L2 and ask ourselves what's happening. So let's blow that up. These are high contours here and these are low contours. So there's L2 sitting a million miles away from Earth. Look at the contours around L2. If we look at what way is downhill, you can see that downhill is towards L2 in these directions, but away from L2 in those directions. That's downhill, that's downhill, and down, this is high, and so downhill is pointing towards the L2 point itself. So L2 is not a hilltop. If it was a hilltop, downhill would be in all directions. If it was in the bottom of a well, downhill would always point to the bottom of the well. But here it isn't. Two of them point in, two of them point out. It's not a hilltop, it's not a well, it's a saddle point. Or, as the rest of us would think of it, it's a Pringle. So the take-home take message is, orbital mechanics is not as difficult as people will make you believe, and the James Webb is sitting on a Pringle. Okay? So in this particular case, it's actually not sitting just at L2, it's actually doing a little dance around L2. How come it can do that? Well, if it happens to go up this way, downhill, brings it back again, because the Earth is pushing it this way. If it happens to come this way a little bit, downhill brings it back to L2. So it can quite happily orbit in this way. What it can't do is afford to go too far this way, because downhill simply will drag it to Earth, or in this way, downhill will drag it away from Earth. So it does have to use a little bit of fuel. On the whole, it can quite happily just sit there. But if it starts to drift very, very, very slowly towards Earth, they have to fire a few station-keeping rockets just to keep it in position. That's why it needs fuel. If you remember when they launched it and got it to L2, they said, we've done such a good job of getting it to L2, the fuel should last for 20 years. If the fuel runs out, it will end up getting pulled towards the Earth. As long as the fuel is there, they'll just give it a nudge every few months just to keep it at this magic position of L2. Okay, so it's not magic. The maths is not easy. Getting James Webb to sit there with the precision they did was a fantastic achievement, but the concept of why L2 exists is not that difficult. The combined pull of the Earth and the Sun make it go round in one year, and hence it goes round with the Earth. Short pause for any other questions? Yes? Uh, I'm guessing that makes the, the random person on the front here, yes. Uh, I'm guessing that that makes the event point very random. Like, I can't imagine that this random person there is going to go over and go and go and go and Yes. Um, I haven't said so, but some Lagrange points are closer than the sun. They are really good places to park spacecraft for observing the sun, because the Earth never gets in the way. With the Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope is going round the Earth, which means it can't s fixate on a star for that long, because as it's going round the Earth, every once in a while, the Earth gets in the way. So if you're in orbit around the Earth, you have to worry about where the objects are. If you sit at a Lagrange point, for instance, the one between the Earth and the Sun, the Sun is always visible. If you park the James Webb Space Telescope at L2, the Earth and the Sun and the Moon are always over there, which means you can always enjoy beautiful views of the sky, unlike the Hubble, in which every few minutes it's going into or out of the Earth's shadow. Follow-up question. No. L1 is occupied, L2 is occupied with various spacecraft. Gaia, the spacecraft is at L2, James Webb is at L2. Technically not at that point, but doing little dances around it. They miss each other, so that's fine. L3, L3 is on the other side of the Earth's orbit and is the sort of, if you like, counter Earth. That's where you could sort of put another Earth on the opposite side of the Sun, but it turns out that's uh, not a good place to put anything mainly because you can't talk to it. If you put a spacecraft there, you can't see it because it's always behind the sun as you both go round the sun in one year. And the other two um, positions, L4 and L5, 
can be used for positioning spacecraft where you want them deliberately to be off axis of the Earth. So the other Lagrange points are useful. Um, in the case of going to the moon, they can be used for communication satellites because they're always in the right position of sky to be able to bounce signals off. So there are good reasons for wanting to use those as well. Okay, we sound like we've got no music now. So I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Steve Barrett. Oh, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. There's <laughs> no so still music. But I can see a man in a white t-shirt running to change the music. <laughs> and Dr. Steve Barrett. Thank you. And we're back again. <clears throat> so with misconception number one, I showed that it is possible to photograph an object 12 billion, 12 and a half billion light years away, looking back in time 12 and a half billion years, right to the back of the universe, the early stages of the universe, looking at an object receding from us faster than the speed of light. Then I told you about black holes don't suck, dark matter is not what you think it is. And finally, rocket science is nowhere near as difficult as you think it is. Just ditch the maths, everything else makes sense. This third, sorry, fourth misconception is a little different because we're, instead of thinking of the vast large size, we're going down subatomic. We're going down to quantum mechanics. So, we think we know what atoms are. All of us think we know what atoms are. We're made of molecules, molecules are made of atoms, atoms are made of other stuff, it doesn't really matter. So we think of atoms as being a nucleus with electrons buzzing around. And that's a fairly nice visual idea. It's not right, but it's a nice visual way of thinking about what atoms are. The re one reason that's not a particularly good representation is because it doesn't tell us that all the electrons have different energies. These all look like they're the same electron buzzing around in different orbits. So maybe we ought to think about uh, electrons in atoms as being in different orbits, a bit like at, uh, planets in the solar system. But the danger is when we start treating atoms like a solar system, which they are quite definitely not. And we often have this two-dimensional picture of uh, electrons in different so-called orbitals. We have to remind ourselves that atoms are actually three-dimensional, so we should be thinking about shells rather than these rings here in this two-dimensional picture. But still, we always come back to an attempt to visualize what an atom actually is. That's because we, as humans, are always trying to visualize rather than just describe in words. And we might say, well, those pictures that we just had of little solar systems are wrong. We should be accepting the fact that when an electron is in an atom, we don't really know where it is and we don't really know what it's doing. The best we can do is to talk about the probability of something happening. What is the probability that this electron has this much energy? What's the probability that if we fire these two atoms together, this will be the result? What's the probability that these atoms are going to make this molecule? So we really ought to throw away the clockwork universe of Newton and accept the fact that all atomic, all quantum mechanical phenomena are effectively probabilistic. Some people still don't like that idea, but I think we've come to accept that that must be the case. But when it comes to describing atoms, we definitely have a problem. We can describe atoms with words, and we can use various words. We can talk about particles and waves, and we can talk about electrons in orbits, and we can talk about an electron spin. But none of these words mean what we think they do, and they don't mean the same as common sense words. We can talk about an electron spinning, and we talk, can talk about the Earth spinning, and we can talk about the Earth going around the sun in an orbit, but that's not the same as what electrons are doing. When we talk about electron spin, we don't mean it's spinning like the Earth is spinning, but the word has come to take that sort of connotation. And that's part of the problem. When we use words, words have other meanings. And we have to tell people, when I say this, I don't mean this, I mean that. So you always have to explain what the words mean. And basically, the English language is not the best language to describe what the hell atoms are. So should we be using pictures instead? Well, I've already said that pictures can be helpful, but that's not what an atom looks like. And even that isn't as well. That's a representation of probability functions that we might use to calculate what atoms do, how atoms behave. But that's not, strictly speaking, what an atom looks like. So if we can't really use words and we can't really use pictures, 
there's only one thing that we can actually use to describe atoms properly. And unfortunately, yeah, that's maths. And, and, we're, back, and we're, back to, we're back to rocket science, if you like. Rocket science is hard because of the maths. Throw away the maths, what you're left with is relatively easy. But with describing an atom, if you throw away the maths, you're not left with anything because you can't possibly understand how things behave unless you apply quantum theory. And quantum theory is effectively just a bunch of mathematics. And of course, when it comes to teaching undergraduates or indeed anybody about this is how atoms work, this is how molecules work, this is how the world works, you have to use the maths. And of course, to explain what you're doing, you have to use words. And generally speaking, it helps if you use pictures. You keep excusing yourself by saying, this is not the right picture, but it's the best we can do to help visualize what this maths is trying to tell us. But the bottom line is, you sort of have to use three in a horrible mixture. And the one that is the only one that actually makes any sense whatsoever is the maths. And the maths is not particularly straightforward. We don't teach this in primary school for good reason. You basically have to have a certain amount of maths under your belt, and essentially that means degree level sort of stuff, before you can make sense of the maths is telling you this, so what does that actually mean? Well, it means that the result of this experiment is going to be this result. It doesn't mean we can necessarily visualize what we're doing, but it does allow us to calculate what happens if. What happens if I bang two particles together? What happens if I heat this system up? What if I do this to this molecule? What if I shine this light on this molecule? How is it going to behave? The maths tells us the right answers. Sometimes the maths gives us answers that make no sense whatsoever and are completely opposite to common sense. But then it's easy. That means common sense is wrong. Quantum mechanics has never been shown to give answers that are wrong, but, but it often produces answers that make no sense whatsoever when compared to common sense. And even the architects of quantum mechanics, Werner Heisenberg and uh, Erwin Schrödinger, didn't necessarily like what they were doing. They constructed quantum theory 100 years ago. It hasn't been broken down yet, but at the time, they said, we wish to talk about the structure of atoms, but we cannot talk about atoms in ordinary language. It was realized that all you can do is apply maths and get the right answers. If you try and describe why in words, you get stuck. And Schrodinger said something similar, but perhaps even more profound. Atomic physics has shown us that atoms have no meaning. That is an amazing thing for a physicist to say. In other words, atoms can only be understood in terms of experimental measurement. In other words, you can ask, if this happens, then what happens next? Or if I do this to this molecule, what's going to be the result? Quantum mechanics allows us to predict with extreme precision how the world works. And yet, you could argue that atoms have no meaning. They are just mathematical constructs. And if you believe that we are made of things that aren't real, then you have a problem saying, well, surely that's real. That's got to be real. And it's made of stuff. It's made of fibers, which are made of molecules, which are made of atoms. So surely atoms must be real. But the architects of quantum theory says, well, no. When you get down to small stuff, the actual building blocks have no meaning. Only the mass that tells you how they behave has any meaning. And that takes a lot of thought. And you think to yourself, well, mm, yeah, uh, 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 well, OK, uh, yeah, the maths works. But then you think, well, surely atoms exist. We can build microscopes. We can build microscopes using quantum theory to build microscopes that show us what the world is made of. This is a scanning, tunneling microscope. It's a microscope built on the principles of a, of a quantum mechanical effect called tunneling. And using that, we can image small objects. Notice the size of this image on one side is 850 picometers. It's less than one nanometer on each side of the image. And then we see objects on a scale of less than a nanometer. And we interpret these blobs of as, well, they must be atoms, surely. So it looks like atoms exist, but quantum theory only allows us to manipulate what's going on using maths and we accept the fact that maths gives us the right answers, but in a, some respects, we don't know why. And some people say that's not a problem. If a theory gives you the right answers, 
shut up and calculate. Don't worry about why it gives you the right answers. We know it works. We've tested it for 100 years. Nothing has proved it wrong. Some people are still trying to break it, but nothing has proved it wrong so far. So just get on and use it. And whenever I see a scanning tunneling image like this, where I think I'm looking at individual atoms, these atoms are carbon, I think. Uh, these are individual carbon atoms. And we remind ourselves that on this scale, a grain of sand would be about the size of the moon when you think of the size of this image on the screen there. And I always think of William Blake's poem, To See a World in a Grain of Sand. So whether atoms exist or not, is that philosophy or is that physics? Point of discussion, perhaps. That is the fourth of my areas of misconception. Thank you.